if you look at like what how Facebook and Google, more so Facebook, has had a lot of success um, attracting media dollars, is because they know who you are and they know what you want. And you know, optimizing, you know, everyone, everyone use, no one doesn't use the pixel anymore. Everyone uses the pixel for Facebook to do that self optimization because it's going to do a better job than you're going to be able to do with your own interest targeting and things like that. Um, but where Facebook kind of breaks down is they're not personalizing the web post Facebook. So once you leave Facebook and you go to a website, that website is static for you and me. And um, you know, if you're a company, uh, even like a big company that uses, say, Optimizely, where you're A-B testing things, you're still A-B testing the majority of all of your traffic. You know, only really sophisticated guys are A-B testing little audience groups or individual messaging. So the world I envision, and you know, it's not going to be too long away, you know, maybe 12, 24 months, we're going to start seeing this where there's a, a high level of individual personalization. So you know who somebody is, um, you know, Eric likes whiskey, when we're going to a certain website, we're gonna use that personality information to dynamically generate copy and imagery that's gonna resonate with you, that's gonna help drive that conversion experience. And so we're, we're actively working on a lot of that, and it's complicated stuff, but uh, I think that it's gonna be really valuable. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, we are very lucky to have a friend of mine on, Jason Kriske, founder and CEO of Straw House. Straw House is a massive customer acquisition engine, an agency that represents high growth companies. Uh, Jason is a master of Facebook ads, a master of policy. He's a mastermind at our upcoming Facebook Elite Retreat, as well as a speaker and trainer at our Facebook Mastery Live. Uh, he's from Kelowna, which is very close to my island of Vancouver Island. Welcome to the Roadbust Marketer today, Jason. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Um, thank you. Feeling, uh, feeling very great. Good to be here. Excellent. Okay, cool. So I gave you a little intro there, and it's it, you know when we're when we're telling people about our speakers at our events, um, it's. You know, you you obviously have your following. You have people who know about you, but not a lot of people. Maybe not everyone yet knows about the giant, the juggernaut that is Straw House that you've created. So why don't you tell us a little bit by starting with your marketers' heroes journey about what brought you to how you started to where you are now? Yeah, that uh, that um, kind of presence has been largely by design. We've you know we've been trying to kind of stay in the shadows for a while, trying to you know uh, figure out some challenges in their scale and everything. So now that we're a little bit more public, um, super happy to talk about it. Uh, so I got into digital uh, about 10 years ago through email and uh, it was kind of uh, a bit of dumb luck but I had a you know a, a technical background and uh, I had a friend who ended up um, getting into email work when I worked with Neverblue which was a early affiliate. Uh, My comp- I'm employee number six at Neverblue. Oh, yeah, totally. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, so he was uh, at Neverblue and then he got into email as an affiliate and uh I uh, started working with him, and is it Pierre? he started sending. Uh, no, we worked with Pierre. Who <laughs> actually it was working with Pierre nice. a little. Bit. And uh, you know, we were sending a lot of email, uh, very untargetedly, to a lot of people, and uh, we really focused on the deliverability engineering, really, as opposed to the marketing. And it was just yeah. you know, sending as many offers as we could in early days. Um, you know, you didn't really think about it from a marketing perspective. It was crafting a subject line that people would open. So we were t- together with um, that group of guys for a little while and then uh, parted ways and then started uh, another company um, with someone else from the island, actually, and uh, worked in email there for another couple of years. And then I realized, I started to see the, the, the shift. You know, this is probably back in, I want to say, 2012, where um, you know, Facebook was starting to come on the scene. Um, targeted m- messages were a lot more um, relevant and driving a lot higher EPCs. And uh, at that time, the partner I had in that company didn't quite see things the same way. So I uh, sold off my interest there and then started building infrastructure for social advertisers, okay. um, allowing guys to really buy at scale on Facebook. And, uh, you know, as, as it is in this industry. I'm on a forum online. I'm talking to people, and I'm talking to this guy in the feed, um, who, as we quickly discovered, uh, you know, lived in the same building as me, in the same town as me, just on the floor below me. 
And uh, he was uh, an early Facebook newsfeed guy. So I'm um, buying a lot of media for a lot of different kinds of products, um, primarily in the Nutra space. And so we kind of traded services for a little while and then realized that if we combined forces, we could uh, you know, build something really cool. Nice. So we, yeah. Very cool. So when you started, so we started, we, I remember, uh, you know, when we, when we talked about email back that, you know, those early days, yeah, I think it's a really good point that you bring up that, that when you're doing that kind of marketing and probably even later, some of the infrastructure based Facebook marketing, uh, it's not marketing in the traditional sense, right? Like it's not, it's really not about like leading people through a funnel necessarily. It's, it's a, just a pure volume game at, at that point. It's a hundred percent. Like we were measuring our effectiveness and like ECPM, so like earnings per thousand pieces of mail, and it was not a high number. Um, but uh, yeah, it was all untargeted. Um, you know, sending as much as we possibly could. It was, but we had control over some eyeballs, and we were just driving eyeballs to as many things as we could. We weren't segmenting our lists. We weren't, you know, treating our users with respect. Um, yeah. It was just more data, and then more offers, and then just running that like a bit of a factory. Um, and then over time, we started to see like diminishing returns, you know, as um, more and more people were sending more and more email, it was a lot harder to garner attention in that in that inbox. I spent a little bit of time when I was at Neverblue actually managing the internal mailing team there. And it was around that time that The Daily Show did a did a uh, interview with Scott Richter from CPA Empire at the time. And yeah. that one is still one that I go back to and watch every now and then because it's when Rob Corddry is basically like, so you're like a garbage man, but in reverse, <laughs> which I thought was a very, a very good metaphor. And he's, it was before everyone realized that it was satire. So it's a, it's quite a, quite a good interview. You should go check it out if you haven't seen it, but it's, it's funny. It's just, it's the way people, everyone, so many affiliates in this business start out with that mentality. And it's sort of what's, what we're seeing, I think is this mass maturation a little bit of, of people realizing that the, that volume game and the, 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 the black hat, gray hat game of, of sort of like deceiving the, the, the system in order to, to get your ads through those, you know, th those are going to have diminishing returns more and more. It's funny. I, I have other friends in black hat in other areas and they're telling me the same thing that they're seeing the sort of noose tightening on these things uh, across the board. So it's, I, you know, I really think it behooves advertisers to start thinking about their businesses in a really long term fashion, which is what you guys have obviously done. Yeah, it's a hundred percent. And I started to see that in email. You know, it was a cat and mouse game. You're playing, you know, cat and mouse with these ISPs that have these enormous resources. And I, you know, we could outsmart them, you know, on a month by month, quarter by quarter. But there was just no way that we were going to win the long term game. And I think you'll see that in email with how Gmail become very effective at filtering out spam and unwanted messages. And then, uh, yeah, on the on the on the Facebook side, um, you know. Car we we weren't always in the kind of industry that we're in now. We were doing a lot of other kinds of shades of gray. And you know, about a year into Straw House, we made this uh, very stark decision. We drew a line in the sand. We said that we're no longer going to work with companies like that. We're going to focus on these kinds of businesses. We're going to build a uh, very direct relationship with Facebook and uh, just determine how we can kind of massage some things towards compliance and uh, work within the framework that they want to work with. And and I know that's what Facebook, you know, I've heard Facebook, they won't say this on the record probably, but I've heard them aside be like, if you're a black hat advertiser doing this much in revenue, then you have the capital, you have a lot of the infrastructure, you have the know-how, you have the intelligence to, to, to build white hat businesses and sort of like they're really looking for those black hat guys to sort of rehab on their own so that they don't have to be shut off because they want that money as much as anyone. 100%. And I really, I think what it comes down to is the short versus the long money. You know, if you're focused on making, you know, X five figures that day versus, you know, you know, Y hundreds of millions in the future. And so the business that we're building is really focused on capturing that long term value while generating some, you know, good, you know, immediate term revenue. Awesome. So pin it down a little bit for me about what Straw House is now. Uh, what kind of clients are you looking to work for? What kind of products? Because I know you're not, you're, you're, do you describe yourself as an agency? Like what is the sort of top line of how you, you describe know, Straw House? You know, we don't ever use the term agency because I think that creating a little bit of mystique around what you do and letting the results really speak for themselves. Um, and that lot, badass wolf logo. Yeah. I mean, that and then kind of the whole um, gestalt of like what we've kind of created around Straw House as a brand creates a lot of curiosity and a lot, and when we've been able to drive a lot of success for a lot of um, other companies and use those numbers 
to say, hey, this is what we this is what we achieve. We achieve growth, and then we do it, you know, using a you know a mixture of media and some secret sauce and some um, experience and some insight, and we will take all of that and we will just get these results for you. And we do it on a performance basis. And people are a little bit less concerned with what you call it or or how it works um, if you're willing to put your money where your mouth is. And that's what we that's really what we do. And we've been able to translate that into working with clients that are, you know, private equity backed or venture backed um, portfolio businesses um, to all kinds of other, you know, interesting emerging e-commerce brands and uh, companies where performance may not necessarily work or look like it's working on the outset. But once you kind of massage a funnel and then provide a little bit of education and consultancy, then you're able to get something that works at scale. Very interesting. And that, and that is an approach that I hear more and more. So like, you know, if you're getting into e-commerce, a lot of people are, uh, you know, looking to drop ship and they're looking to, to, to flip products from, from Alibaba or things like that. But the people who are really winning, uh, long-term again with e-commerce are people that are focusing on the marketing. They're focusing on the, the, the marketing and then partnering with people that already have the products in place in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah. And they have the the returns, all the headaches that you get from drop shipping, whether it's return rate or complaints or shipping times or all those things. It's so much better when you can find a company who has all that stuff locked down but sucks at the marketing. And that's where you can come in as a Facebook expert. Yeah, you can take an offline business um, that's not direct to consumer, take them direct to consumer. Um, we have a, a new, um, I'm going to read it Slack. Uh, we have a new um, company that we've actually. Um, spun out of Straw House, which is called a CPG Lab, which is basically uh, a consumer packaged goods brand incubator where we grow and start and acquire these businesses and then package them up to be ready for uh, mass scale online. Very cool. So you're working with clients like this. Um, I'm, I'm, are you still doing affiliate stuff? Is there still sort of affiliate stuff happening in the background with your media buying team? I think there's always, um, um, I, I never say never, so if there's an opportunity um, with a, a CPA-oriented product or offer that's coming from, you know, a trusted um, advertiser or something, we will always, you know, and it, it fits within the compliance window of what we want to do, we will always drive some volume to those things because it's pretty low-hanging fruit. We have the ability. Um, so it's, it's always nice to kind of keep those things around, but it definitely is a lot less than it used to be. And direct, I'm sure always, if not whenever possible. Yeah, we only work with, uh, AORs or advertisers directly. Um, the, not only from like, uh, being able to tighten up that margin opportunity, but also from a level of control. Um, what we find is that there's a lot of things that experience and knowledge that we have as to how the pages need to look or the language or the funnel. And when you're working through an intermediary, it's very difficult to be able to communicate that effectively and have that things turn around in the time frame that's effective. Yeah. All, even when I was doing affiliate marketing, all my best wins were when I was able to directly interface with the client, even though because I was actually an internal media buyer at Neverblue. Uh, and so but but that, just even that ability to step up the chain and talk directly to that person through the account executive or whoever uh, made a huge difference for the campaigns that we would run. Yeah, it's it. You're is you it's easier to be able to get better alignment. Yes. And, and that's what we always focus on. It's like when we're winning, when our clients are winning, that's that's when we can drive some real scale and make some real money. And that's the only way that you'll have a lot you'll have long term opportunity is if you're not burn like if you know, there's a lot of burning of the advertiser that goes on in those early stages of, of affiliate marketing businesses. A lot of hiding yourself and you get busted with one thing, so you spin out a new thing here and but that's not long term. You're gonna get caught out and you're not providing value in the ecosystem. So it's not it's not good for your karma either when you act like that. You know, it's it's funny because a lot of people don't really see it that way, especially early on, um, because you think to yourself, Oh, I just made a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, I must be creating value. I wouldn't be ending up with this money. But really it's you know it's degenerative to the whole um you know the whole ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I wanted to go back to something you mentioned too that I thought was interesting that I made a note of. You were talking about Straw House and the mystique around it. It's funny, like uh, Todd Dunlop, who is the founder of Neverblue, who is uh, one of my mentors in the in the business. Like building websites with him, and he was always saying, "If you can't read exactly what a website does in the first in the header of the page, then I'm out of there." But it's interesting when you're operating at the scale that you're operating at, and you like I see that as a totally other strategy, right? Where where you lead the, with the results, and then people can back calculate whatever they want from you as long as you can do those those kinds of things. 
Yeah, I think it's, you know, as far as our deal flow is very organic now, we don't do any outbound. Um, everything really funnels to us based on the traction that we got for, um, you know, initial clients. Like when you're doing something, you're doing a really great job driving a lot of value and success for someone. If they've got friends that are other advertisers or potential advertisers, you know that they're singing your praises. I mean, we've even had some relationships that didn't work out very well because the offer wasn't well suited to be scaled. But the, we have referrals from those people, and it, that comes down to like you know how you treat people, um, treating with them respect, and um, you know we're very candid about what we do, um, and you know being open in a sense where people are very much uh, aware that that you know what you're doing and that you know it better than they do, and that if they create the right economic incentives, then they can just kind of sit back and let things happen. Nice. And whereas you can just let them focus on the product, which is what they're passionate about and what they're good at. And it seems like a real recipe for success. So with your agency, this, this line in the sand that you drew, was that really the pivotal turning point for you guys? Do you think like, has that, has that decision helped you in other ways? Has it helped you attract staff for instance? Has it helped you with funding or with just sort of like your position in the community? Well, I think that it definitely helped because um, there, there was a bit of a sense with some of the early team members and we made that decision when we were about five or six people, um, amongst some, some of those people, they didn't, they couldn't go home and tell their mom what they did. Mm -hmm. You know, like they, they didn't feel good about it. They didn't feel good about the products or the maybe methodologies and making that kind of transition to help us be able to attract, I'd say brighter, uh, more creative, more, um, driven people. That's interesting. I'm sure their moms still don't understand what they do though. Oh, they don't understand, but at least they can. Yeah. yeah, that's right. My mom still, to this day, I've explained to her over like whiskeys, like so many times exactly what it is that we do, and she still really doesn't get it. Um, could be whiskeys. But she's a one. Yeah, that could be the whiskeys. That's uh, quite possibly. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about. Uh, we, we, we've decided we want to talk a little bit about the evolution of e-commerce and we've hinted at it a little bit. Um, but I know that another aspect of what you guys do, and I don't know if you're public about this yet, but it's that you're building tools. You're building tools for people in the, in the e-commerce game. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the market evolving and then what you guys are doing to, to help in that space? Yeah. So I think that there is a blending um, of direct response and e-commerce um, that's going to provide a lot of like long-term value to build a lot of um, interesting brands. Um, just as a bit of an aside, I don't know if you saw last week that uh, Native was acquired by Procter and Gamble. Um, so Native uh, Cosmetics they make uh, like a like a organic deodorant uh, okay. or deodorant that doesn't have like all these harsh chemicals. Yep. And so Moy is the guy who you know started that company, got a little bit of seed funding, and then drove all of the acquisition on Facebook to grow that business. Um, and he was spending you know six figures a month growing, uh, had a really great CPA, we audited their account, and we are looking at like, well, we're not gonna be able to beat that. He was doing a good job using some kind of content in between ad and uh, you know conversion point, um, okay. so adding a direct response element to it. And uh, you know, he just sold that company for $100 million, you know, 20, 24 months in. And that just goes to show you the, the, the value that can be created over the long term, and it's not a complicated business. It's fairly straightforward with a few moving pieces. But focusing on that long-term value and brand um, created a, lo a lot of more wealth than if he was just focused on trying to, you know, force trial continuity or something like that. Um, and the same so stories of like the watch, the, the, the woman that created the watch empire, basically, she went out and, and had these things designed and actually, I forget what the, it's like Momentum or something, or I forget the actual name of the watch company. Yeah, MVMT. MVMT, that's what it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that, that like, so, but, but isn't that a daunting, per, like, that's pretty daunting for the average person looking to maybe jump, say from affiliate marketing into e-commerce. Like what are those first steps that you take as someone who wants to make that leap? Is it a matter of partnering with the people who do that already or should they be dreaming up their own brands? You know, I think a lot of it's education and I think, you know, maybe drop shipping or like uh, low quality e-commerce is a, uh, is a good step to kind of like learn what a lot of those mechanisms are. But you know, identifying a market and an opportunity, and then building a brand and a product around it, and starting small, like you know, we run uh, market validation testing before we decide to even get involved in a product, and we're able to do that for a fairly low, you know, four-figure amount uh, between building things out and testing things. And it's about collecting that data and having a good model to be able to start moving forward with, and knowing what your acquisition costs are, what your average order values are. You know, what are those KPIs that you need to be able to hit? And then, you know, growing it from there. 
Uh, and that's, you know, with the, the tool that we're building, actually, it's the technology that we use to scale Straw House over the last few years. Um, we're kind of repackaging it and spinning it out as a SaaS product for all e-commerce advertisers to be able to use. Hmm, very cool. And that's what's in your timeline is sometime in 2018 for that, basically? Yeah, we just had our alpha come out yesterday. So we've got some early testing going on. Um, and I'm hoping to have maybe the ability for a few people around uh, affiliate world or um, you know maybe around the, the, the Facebook Mastery uh, mm -hmm. program to kind of try it out. It's uh, got a good integration with Shopify right now. But what it does is it, you know, it's something that really simplifies the ability to buy media by, you know, knowing what's working, what's not working. Do you have enough data um, and referring other kind of other interesting insights? Um, the goal there is to make it very simple, though, because, I mean, it can be a very obviously media buying can be a very complicated process. And how do you be able to simplify it and uh, leverage yourself as opposed to having to have teams and teams of people? Ah, very interesting. So. Well, the thing that, that all of this this kind of advertising creates essentially for the end consumer is a sort of and, – and we're doing this right now. We're, you know, we're, we're doing a form of sequential remarketing essentially where, where users who've seen a certain image or a certain uh, messaging, they get put into an, into an audience group where they get – now that we know that they've seen this, they, now they get served this. And if they do another action, it's quite possible they'll get served a message that says – uh, you know, well, we know your objections might be this, but here's how we'd overcome those. And so it's this like highly personalized sort of like hyper funnel experience. Like what, what, what are your, some of your thoughts on the personalization of the web and, and, and the way the marketing is going in that in that direction? That's like my hot button, man. I could talk about that all day. Um, so in addition to that product that I just talked about that we're releasing soon, that insight product, we have another, um, kind of CMS, um, funnel type tool that we have that is driven towards personalization. So, um, you know, if you look at like what, how Facebook and Google, more so Facebook, has had a lot of success um, attracting media dollars, is because they know who you are and they know what you want. And, you know, optimizing, you know, everyone, everyone uses, no one doesn't use the pixel anymore. Everyone uses the pixel for Facebook to do that self-optimization because it's going to do a better job than you're going to be able to do with your own interest targeting and things like that. Um, but where Facebook kind of breaks down is they're not personalizing the web post Facebook. So once you leave Facebook and you go to a website, that website is static for you and me. And, um, you know, if you're a company, uh, even like a big company that uses, say, Optimizely, where you're A-B testing things, you're still A-B testing the majority of all of your traffic. You know, only really sophisticated guys are A-B testing little audience groups or individual messaging. So the world I envision, and, you know, it's not going to be too long away, you know, maybe 12, 24 months, we're going to start seeing this where there is a, a high level of individual personalization. So you know who somebody is, um, you know, Eric likes whiskey. When we're going to a certain website, we're going to use that personality information to dynamically generate copy and imagery that's going to resonate with you, that's going to help drive that conversion experience. And so we're, we're actively working on a lot of that, and it's complicated stuff, but uh, I think that it's going to be really valuable moving forward. And I, and I can see brands being really interested in it as well, you know, rather than this one-size-fits-all message that they're used to delivering via broadcast, being able to create systems that, yeah, treat people differently based on what we know about them. We, we, first of all, we know how powerful this is to some extent with some of the political advertising that has happened over the past couple of years with... Um, you know, with Trump and with Brexit and with, you know, we know that the internet, we know Facebook particularly played like a very big role in those campaigns. Um, and, and, and so it's, in, it's going to be interesting to see. It's funny. I just, I did a, a pitch recently for uh, a, a Canadian company, a content company. And, uh, and we were talking about sort of mar marching people through a sequential thing. And it's, it's, it's incredibly how powerful funnels in general can be. And when they get applied on a massive scale, I could see it being a huge, huge impact on the industry. Yeah, certainly. I think that the uh, the recent political cycle in the U.S. was really illuminating to see, you know, exactly how effective it is. Um, and I'm kind of a little bit conscious of what this may mean for society. But like, if, if I don't do it, someone's going to do it. I yep. mean, I'm sure other people are working on it too. Um, the Russians are for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the political stuff. I mean, that's a whole different conversation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the ability for uh, me to go to a website and for that um, website or that data layer to know that I have certain interests and certain, um, you know, behavioral styles 
that's going to lend itself to a different kind of sell and a different kind of um, you know perception being created to it is is only going to increase conversion rates. And combining that with um, you know uh, algorithmically driven multi arm bandwidth experimentation where you're constantly shifting and testing, I think that's one of the things that people kind of get locked into is they create a website, they do some testing, they get the conversion rate to something that's that's good enough. And then they've I've seen advertisers leave it there for years. Yeah. You know, the yeah. world's constantly changing. Consumers are constantly changing. Um, so you need to be always testing. And uh, that's you know part of this product we're building where it always tests a certain percentage of your traffic. Um, yeah, it's it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting to see the effects of it. I'm very optimistic about it. I remember some of the big challenges because at my last company it was a mobile DSP, and and some of the challenges of actually tracking users across sessions and things like that is very difficult outside of the walled garden of Facebook. Is that is that all done through through like uh, like server postbacks and and device ID matching and like is that stuff also because I know it's funny like people want. Two, people's two biggest complaints about the internet are, oh, you know, like these ads are never relevant to me and ads are creepy. Like, well, what do you want? You want relevant ads or do you want, you know what I mean? Like, is, is that a big, is that an issue that you're running into, especially outside of Facebook? Um, I think like from a technical perspective, there's definitely challenge as far as using the data to start tying things together. Um, I don't know how much I can comment on that. Like that's kind of the sauce. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's definitely a challenge. I think that um, people were, they feel like the ads are creepy. Um, that has more to do with kind of how the, how the ads are working. So I think, uh, one of the primary things that you can do there is like, is frequency. So if you're retargeting somebody and like, so on display and you've got recency and all this stuff, or even on Facebook, if you know, if you've got a retargeting campaign, that has got a frequency of like, that's gone above three, you're going to start to piss people off. And that's when, when people start to notice it, that's when they start to take action against it and it starts to cause brand degradation. So it's about being smart about that retargeting and then continually repositioning different messages and then maybe going through and changing the funnel bit so you re-engage them in a different way. Um, yeah. And, yeah, make sure that when you are hitting them for a new cycle, you're at least saying something different or at least you're, you're, you're showing a new angle of the product potentially. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to just prospect somebody and then retarget them with prospecting ads until they, you know, submit. I mean, you're going to end up creating negative feedback, which is going to end up, you know, driving up your CPMs and it's going to end up, you know, tanking your campaign over time. And you're not going to want to know why, but why it's happening. Yeah, it's uh, it's just amazing to me how much sophistication there is still to come in the advertising space. Like we're, we're, you know, you go from being uh, thought of as a, the Wild West, you know, which 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 is the space we both came out of, this affiliate marketing space, to, to to all of these skills being highly valuable in in a in the performance environment for the wider audience, for brands and things like that. So it's it's really exciting to see. It, it is. I mean, and it's funny because even you know I have this conversation all the time. Even granted, all like as far as we've come. Um, I'm still confronted with like, why is there not a tool for this? Or why is there not a good solution for this? Like there is still a lot of work to be done to be able to um, create simple you know, levels of automation and, and insight. And uh, you know, there's a, a, I think people in the performance industry, because of the expertise that we have with how things actually integrate and function, are better positioned to advise and create that kind of technology. Nice. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Thailand. Thailand is a, a very magical place for me personally. It, it's where I went right after university. I went there and I taught kindergarten and winged it for a year with my film degree. Uh, and it just and that's actually where I met my wife, which is why I now live out west. I went back there last year and I got offered this job. I went back there again and did a webinar and so and I, I, and sold a bunch of of these courses. It's just this incredibly magical, powerful place for me. I'm so excited to be going back. And we have you booked. You're, you, you're at AWA as well. You're doing the full gamut. Yeah. You're speaking at AWA, yeah. Facebook Mastery Live, and the Elite Retreat. I, I uh, signed up for, or I, I said yes to pretty much everything. And now I'm really bearing the brunt of having to produce all of this content. <laughs> I'm like, I have my only shift. Um, but it's great. I'm excited. And uh, I'm happy to be involved. Um, you know, And that was one of those things where like, uh, when I'm talking to you and um, um, who else was I talking to? Chad. Uh, Chad, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like I couldn't say no because I mean I, I love obviously being able to kind of share the knowledge that I've been able to gather over this you know career and um, to help drive insight and success for more people. 
Very so. cool. So what do you now? Just just so I have it on record here, what are what what are you? How are you breaking down your three talks? You're talking. Uh, I know policy is a big one for you, uh, and we're very yeah. excited about that. Like, what are the key topics you're going to be hitting? Uh, yeah, so in the uh, in the AWA keynote, I'm going to be talking about how we constructed and built Straw House um, over you know three years to drive up to seventy million dollars a year in revenue. Um, you know, kind of trials, tribulations, things we learned, things we wouldn't do again, things we would definitely do again. Um, it's a bit of my kind of personal story with some good takeaways, I think. And then uh, I'll be talking about measurement um, in uh, in the Facebook Mastery Live. Uh, and I don't think I'm talking about policy there. I mean, I'm talking about policy in the elite retreat. Elite retreat. And I think I'm doing a panel with uh, Maria from Facebook about policy as well at AWA. Oh, I'm moderating that one, so I have oh. the, I have the questions all ready for that one. And oh. you, I, we didn't tell you this too, but we're hoping you can do a panel as the final thing at FBML as well, where we get everyone on stage and get people to ask questions, and we'll have a drink. It's going to be fun. We'll, we'll spring that on you later. Yeah, the Q and A is my favorite part. Actually, you know, it's uh, I'm not a big, not a huge fan of doing kind of keynotes and, and stuff like that, but I love answering people's questions and engaging them in the conversation. Yeah. So, and honestly, I sh we can have this conversation. which maybe should have had this off air. We've talked a little bit about what you're doing at the elite retreat, but yeah. in terms of structure for that particular topic, I really think if you're able to come there and really just have a a, an a great conversation about policy with the attendees. Um, like I don't think you need too much prepared, for instance, just 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 to let you know about the elite retreat. You can have a little bit prepared, but I think a lot of back and forth in that environment will be hugely valuable. Yeah, it was funny. I uh, I'm trying to prepare a lot more. I had a speaking engagement where I was I fell followed up the uh, global president of Microsoft a couple of weeks ago, and he was very prepared. <laughs> I was less so prepared. Um, it was a stark contrast, so I'm That's trying to kind of up my game a little bit, um, but I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, keep that in mind. I know the TANs, for instance, were like, we have never created a presentation for any of our talks, and we don't intend to start here. We're just so they obviously are providing a lot of value in what they do. So I think I think, and especially at this elite retreat, it's going to be we want it to be fairly free flowing. And uh, yeah, I'm just just the level of the a the speaker uh, level of the experts that we're bringing to the table for this thing, and then the level of the attendees. Like we're just getting people from all sorts of different walks, whether it's uh, e-commerce or uh, agency or lead gen or you know gray hat affiliate stuff, and everyone is on board with the mission we're trying to do there. And I think we're going to be able to create some pretty special uh, some pretty special moments. I would say. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, you have like a just an amazing group of people that you've assembled. It sounds like. Yeah, I'm I'm very excited. So, uh, one other thing I want to talk about briefly was uh, the you know, when we last spoke. Just so everyone knows, we are we we tried to do this before, but we were both drunk and you know, the recording didn't work out well. And so it's the lost it's a lost recording that no one will ever see. Uh, so, you you were doing it from like a two G you know connection or something from a dial up modem. It was just cutting yeah. out here and there. But we, you were at a mastermind, so I'm, yeah. I'm curious as someone who is at the the level that you're at in your career, why do you attend masterminds? So, I mean, that mastermind was something that was put on um, by uh, Joel uh, from uh, Biotrust. And he grew a uh, supplement company from, I think, within three years, they grew to $120 million a year in, in uh, annual revenue. Um, you know, and uh, his, they, they did that um, through uh, lead generation and email primarily. And so he's a, he's a real, um, you know, one of the best people in the world at being able to kind of manage that kind of relationship with people and uh, you know I hadn't done a lot of that kind of funnel structure through like you know uh, content um, email acquisition and then you know um, taking people through a story and then getting them to convert through a product like that so uh, there was a lot I knew I could learn I mean it was uh, you know if you're looking at like how much like these really um, these things chart I couldn't believe actually how this is like a plug but like how how inexpensive the the Facebook event that you guys are putting on in Thailand was compared to this other event was uh, I will money multiples more wow. and wow. yeah it was uh, but the value we got of it you know it'll pay it pays for itself within a couple of weeks if you apply it and that's really the, the kind of key thing is to be able to apply it I go to those kinds of events to really um, you know get more information get a different perspective I think it's always important that you keep looking and thinking about things in new ways. It's really easy, particularly in our industry, to have some success with something and say to yourself, this is the way that it is. This is what works. And as long as I keep doing this and keep grinding it away, this is going to continue to work. But um, that's not a growth mindset. And that's not really how things evolve. You know, times change, internet changes. Um, so constantly consuming more high-level information is uh, is really valuable 
able to add new business units or new strategies into our business. Yeah, and, and, and if you're, you know, this is a Facebook ads mastermind. If you're spending five figures a day or even four figures a day, you know, the tips that you generate here are going to be able to, yeah, impact your business if you apply them very quickly. And then the connections you make, like I'm, that's another thing. I think we're bringing people that represent different brands. And I, I really think we're, there's going to be some, and you know, there's going to be an effort to kind of keep this group together as well with uh, some Slack, some Slack chat channeling and, and talking throughout the year potentially. So I think there's a really good opportunity to, for everyone to kind of grow their personal network in some exciting ways. Yeah, it's good. That's something that I'm kind of now that Straw House has kind of came out of the shadows a little bit, I'm taking a little bit more time to kind of get more involved in the kind of wider performance community and um, spread more information, talk to more people. Cool. Now, this is the fun part of the conversation. I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna sandbag you with a question on a very hot button issue. Uh, so, oh, first of all, this is gonna come out during Black Friday weekend, Cyber Monday weekend. Is that a big thing on you? Maybe not on your radar because you're not handling the ads at this po- at this much. But like, how much planning with the companies that you represent are you? putting into the Black Friday phenomenon? Um, you know, Black Friday really is um, not a key day of focus for us because okay. of the, the volume and sales that we drive over the, you know, the six weeks from, you know, um, from November 1st to December 15th, um, you know, like Black Friday is, is, a, is a small fraction of that. Um, there, there is a, a, I would say a reasonable amount of planning, but as you know, like when you're buying media, traction is important. And you know, if you're, you, you need to have uh, campaigns. And again, I'm not running them personally, but you need to have things that have traction going into that period of time. Or you know, that's the most expensive day of the year to buy media. Um, yeah. So yeah. you're gonna get slaughtered if you're, if you're not, uh, if you're not. If you not haven't implemented something kind of long before Black Friday, you just want to be able to ride the wave and maybe adjust your budgets and bids. But um, you know, it should be part of like a a holiday oriented kind of product or um, holiday oriented strategy if you're looking at more e-com oriented things. Okay. Um, when this, I'm, I can announce it here. If you're watching this, it, it, there is a Black Friday sale on courses.istacktraining.com where we're launching all of our acceleration modules, our Facebook masterclass, everything 35% off. Go to our Facebook page for details. But uh, so we're doing it. But again, it's, it fits within the wider infrastructure of, of what we've been building. Uh, and we yeah. just added a few new creatives. And, and but our audience is sort of aware of us already. So yeah, I think like for us, I mean, like we um, our current client mixture doesn't necessarily lend itself well to a lot of those kinds of promotions. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of client mix up, I think. Cool. So now let's talk about what I really want to talk about, which is the government. So the I really I really I really enjoy your post. You know, as you get older, as and as you move up the ladder, sort of financially as well. You know, I think it was was it Churchill that said, "Show me a young man who is a, a conservative, and I'll show you a man who has no heart, and show me an old man who's a liberal, and I'll show you a man with no brain." Uh, and I feel like I'm yeah. right on the I'm right on that cusp right now where. Um, you know, there, the, in, in Canada, we, we get taxed a lot. I don't know if you knew this, but there's a lot of taxes in this country. And I've started to see people talking about this in their own countries as well, about how difficult it is. Like if you, you have a, you, you sell 10 grand a day in e-commerce stuff, that's great. But that often doesn't reflect the bottom line. And when you have a, when you have taxes in the 40% range or higher, uh, and the effective tax rate being much higher, what are, what do you recommend? Like, for, for people in, in this sort of environment? Like, first of all, what are your thoughts on, for instance, the Canadian tax proposals? And, um, and what, are, what are affiliates supposed to do in a place where they're getting pinched on all sides? You know, I, I think it's really interesting um, that uh, <laughs> I, I have lots of opinions, and you're right. Like, I mean, I'm a, a socially liberal person, but as you get older and as you kind of move up, you become more financially conservative. And, uh, you know, these things like taxes, I mean, when you're a one man kind of hit man in the uh, internet marketing and you're working from your basement or whatever, um, you're making money. You don't, I mean, the, the number of people that I know in this industry that didn't realize they had to pay taxes is a uh, list longer than my arm. <laughs> like it's, and then, you know, I know a lot of people who are like, I've got this, you know, multi-million dollar tax bill that they're chipping away at now. Um, so, I mean, that's, uh, you know. Taxes are a necessary part of society to be yes, able to function. Yes. Um, I think that you know the approach um, of like increasing that, like you know, recently in Canada, obviously Trudeau, who's trying to tax um, you know money sitting within a corporation that might be used for other investment purposes, is you know 
a bad idea because it's going to negatively affect the economy. I mean, I make quite a few angel investments in different kinds of technology companies. And, uh, you know, if that measure came to pass, it would limit my ability to be able to invest. Um, and that's not a good idea. Um, that kind of stifles innovation and creativity and will drive that to other jurisdictions. Um, now, I think the benefit for a lot of people in performance, you know, globally is that there are, um, and I don't do this myself, but there are advantageous jurisdictions and structures to be able to create, um, you know, tax mitigating opportunities. So you want to be able to explore those opportunities. Now, like for us, what we're building here in Canada, um, the kinds of companies that we have are focused around, um, you know, they're, they're, they're potentially exitable businesses. So we you know, have a lot of kind of fiduciary responsibility to make sure these things are, are built in appropriate ways and we pay our fair share. Um, but you know, if it was, if I had a different kind of business or if I was living in Thailand, I mean, I'm sure I would have a bit of a different view on it. If you only get paid in crypto gains, like there's no, <laughs> like that's going to be the next round of people getting hit with taxes, right? Is the people that had their 10,000% gains this year. And, uh, and yeah, how do, I don't even know how that works, uh, for crypto. We got paid for our, a course. I hope the tax man isn't listening, but we got paid for, for the elite retreat. Actually, one of our guys paid by, uh, in Bitcoin. So yeah. I don't even know how to report that. You know, it's, it's really interesting. I have a, a, um, a blockchain Bitcoin company that I've invested in that actually takes other companies through ICO. And I'm looking at this whole thing and uh, I don't personally have any crypto holdings because I have uh, the same kind of like those kinds of questions about taxation, regulation, how that how governments will start to kind of, you know, look at um, look at the blockchain and look at this kind of decentralized currency. Um, you know, maybe that's the wrong view. You know, maybe I'll change my mind next week and go buy a ton of Ethereum or something. Uh, but I think yes. that's <laughs> probably like right now it's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, like I'm trying to hedge my bet by investing in companies that are doing work in that space. So I'm not like, you know, I've got a bit of a buffer there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, that's really, a, I mean, if I could get paid in Bitcoin and not be settled somewhere else, I mean, obviously that would be preferable at the time. It, it is. It's, it's, it's very, it's still, in, I understand the principles of it, but it, it's still such an intangible thing that it is, it, it is sort of nerve wracking. And I do have some crypto holdings. If I can remember my wallet password, then yeah. I'm, then I'm down. I mean, I see things like <laughs> a couple weeks ago, that one guy, he had a wallet that he'd um, coded and then he blew up $200 million worth of Ethereum by accident. I mean, that's, Kind of saying to me, that's a little bit, um, you know, that there's a such a high degree of um, in, in insecurity. You know, there it's uh, it's challenging to understand. You know, I wouldn't want to put you know too much in in there at this point in time. Yeah, the the anecdote that that triggered this question about government actually was my wife, who's a CPA, came home from a, a recent. Uh, conference that she went to where this guy was really trying to put the fear of God into all of them saying like, okay, the boomers, they're not giving their money up They're You know, they're hoarding their money away. They have all the loopholes and they're not spending it. And they're living way longer than we thought they would because of all these health improvements and all these supplements that people are mm -hmm. pushing out there that are causing people to live longer. And then we've got this younger generation, which I don't know how much this is true that he was characterizing the younger generation as, you know, precious snowflakes or, you know, millennials who don't maybe fit into the same systems that we've str that we've strove to build or that we've kind of conformed to that they're this sort of like flower generation and they don't want to. So basically what he what they were saying is that the governments of the world are going to be putting the tax debts and the tax burden squarely on the shoulders of yours truly and and you know this generation of, of entrepreneurs and that's something that you yeah you, that it behooves you to kind of speak out against if you don't like that concept i don't know how much fear-mongering it is but i thought it was a pretty scary proposition you know I, I think it's something that's becoming more and more reality as we understand like as the kind of global financial picture becomes more and more muddy and less and less clear about how it actually fits together i mean if you look at companies like apple and google who obviously squirrel their money offshore um, you know, Trump's plan is to you know, drop taxes way down. So these guys start to bring their money back. I mean, that actually might work. Um, but, you know, it might be disastrous. It's hard to really know. Um, you know, there, you're, it's a good point, though. Like, there's um, a lot of, uh, you say, boomers that have squirreled their money away and they're not intent on, on, uh, on paying their fair share. Boomers, man. The greatest generation, my foot. <laughs> Um, okay, so here comes a sandbag. So this is something that's, you go on Reddit today and it's every single subreddit. Everyone is, 
going off on on net neutrality and saving net neutrality. And I have been down enough sort of right wing rabbit holes with with Ben Shapiro or some of these other people to to hear the other side of the idea of net net neutrality. And I'm curious to know where you stand out because I know you're more. Um, fiscally conservative uh, and and maybe even politically conservative at this point, socially liberal. But when it comes to something like net neutrality, I'm curious as to where you stand. Because I've heard some interesting arguments against the government having a monopoly necessarily on telecom, and especially coming from Canada, where our internet costs are just astronomical compared to the rest of the developed world. I'm curious to know what you think about net neutrality. So this, I'm a free market guy. And I think that, you know, in Canada, um, our those information technology costs are high because as a country we mandated that if you're living like, you know, 500 miles from the Arctic circle, you you got broadband, but there's like eight guys there and it costs $300 million to lay a line. But it's a human right. So they need it. Yeah. I mean, so these are the the challenges that we need to understand. It's like, you know, we're on the, I think the decision we need to make is like, what, you know, where do we kind of sit on that kind of free market versus human rights side that, and that's kind of the argument. I don't. I don't. I can't say that I know enough to have a really strong opinion. Um, obviously, you know these companies, um, if they can't do this traffic shaping that they want to do, are incurring these additional costs that these other technology companies are bearing the benefit from. Um, but at the same time, you know, I can obviously understand that I don't want to have to, you know, add, um, you know, YouTube to my internet package. Or you know Netflix, or you know I don't want it to become like you know the the argument against it is like it's going to end up being like a cable package, where you got to select the websites that you want to go to or get faster. I mean that's kind of terrifying. I mean I've built my whole career in business on the idea of like a free and access uh, information. Um, you know it's it's a really hard fucking question. It is a really hard fucking question because uh, and just like news, any news now, you're you're hearing all shades of it, all sides of it, extremes. People are saying. This, you know, the fact is if net neutrality is taken down, it'll be the worst and, and you'll have to pay for, you know, I won't be able to access my right wing news sources anymore, I, you know, or my, my conspiracy stuff will be wiped from the internet, you know, all, all of these things. But it's, but, but the, the arguments for it that I've heard are just about how it will, cre- it will really create a free market so that if there's a need for it, it can be catered to and it can be costed out at the correct amount. Yeah. But I don't know. We may look back and be like, "Oh my God, this you know we had we, these were the halcyon days of the internet when when they were you know when when you had all this free and equal access." Yeah, I think that you kind of got to look at like this is already happening, right? And they just want to be able to have some legislation in place to protect what they're already That's doing. That's very true. Yeah, how many times have you been streaming Netflix or whatever? And you, how many times can you been like, "Yeah, they're throttling me. I'm getting throttled right now." Yeah, and, and like, and the, you know, obviously had like torrents and things like that throttled in the past. And uh, if you look at like, we'll see uh, speedtest.net, everybody uses. So yeah. like, if you look at, like Time Warner, they know that you're using speedtest.net to check your connectivity. So they artificially prioritize that traffic to make it look like your connection is really high. So I don't know if you saw what Netflix did recently where they added in, um, you can do like a speed test on netflix.com. So if, if, they're, if Netflix is being throttled, you can tell. So if Netflix is like, well, if we start prioritizing our traffic so that that bandwidth um, or that speed is higher, then it's basically a win. Um, it's like a backdoor trying to get that to work. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's already happening. They're just looking for some sanctioning around it. Yeah. Well, I think you very effectively danced around that question. I think that was uh, it was very diplomatic. Speaking of diplomacy, uh, you're you're a, you're such a you're a well-spoken guy. You're a you're a respected businessman. You have political opinions. Do you ever you ever uh, you want to announce it now? You want to announce uh, any future political yeah. runs or anything? Candidacy, candidacy for uh, <laughs> no. I think that like you know what, and this is uh, I think this is just good advice. Um, somebody once told me, you know, like the, there's probably a good adage for it, but it's like the guy who's kind of in the front is the guy that, that, you know, bears all the, all the brunt of all the, all the public, uh, or whatever it is. Um, I know a lot of really successful business people. They are not the front people for what they're doing. They are just, uh, they have, um, you know, operational people in front of them doing the things that they do. And they have like this plausible deniability and, uh, you know, like, the, the vision I have for the kind of um, business and company and you know group and fund and all these things that I'm looking to do is really to have other people go and do these things. And uh, I'm certainly happy to back you, Eric. If you ever start to want to run for premier or something, okay, I, will, okay. I will fundraise. 
<laughs> All right. But you want me to take the bullet is what you're saying. Yeah. You want to put me a human shield in the front. All right. Don't put me in the back of the car in Dallas or anything like that. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, you can be the puppet master. You can be the uh, – that, that sounds excellent. Well, Jason, thank you so much for coming on The Robust Marketer today. I'm glad we got this done. And uh, I really look forward to seeing you in Bangkok. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Nice. Bye. Cheers.